we're still in a series that is a, it, it's, it's not a series that's been, how would I put this, promoted or something that I've really been um, strategizing. It's something that I'm really allowing God to lead um, for when he says, it's over, preach about something else. But <laughs> there you go. Uh, I feel like I still need to be in a series of characters in the Bible. Uh, for those of you guys who haven't been here in a while, we started off with uh, God the Father, we went through God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and I hope you guys got a lot through that. We talked about who is Lucifer, we talked about Cain and Abel, we even talked about uh, John the Baptist, which was, I feel like, one of my favorites. But today we're going to jump into a king that I've never taught on before, um, and I pray, Holy Spirit, that you come and you teach. And this is King Josiah, and I'm going to be talking about King Josiah a little bit today and hopefully you can pull from that some spiritual um, food from it and nourishment so the passage we're gonna pull from is 2nd Kings chapter 22 so if you have your Bibles go ahead and turn there with me 2nd Kings chapter 22 then I'll be reading verses 1 and 2 because this story is very long I'm just gonna briefly run over just his introduction and then we'll get into who he is so the word says in 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 1, Josiah was eight years old. Hold on now. Usually, over, and like that, but it starts off by saying, Josiah was eight years old when he became king. And he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedeah of Adiah of Boskath. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the ways of his father David. He did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. Title of the message is simple, it's his name, King Josiah. Let's pray. God, we come before you thanking you for every soul, every heart, every ear that is in this place. I pray that you would anoint me to speak this evening. I ask, oh Father God, that you would open up the windows of heaven tonight, rain down fundamental truth and understanding for us that we could grab on to what you're giving. We hold on to you tonight as you speak. In Jesus' name and all God's people say, amen and amen. Thank you so much. Come on, give it up for Anne Marie. So before we can get into the life of Josiah, King Josiah, as we did with every character we went over, I have to kind of give you a backstory or pull back a little bit uh, prior to their life because it helps you understand who they are a little bit as we get into the details. So let's go back a little bit into, I think it's his great grandfather, uh, Hezekiah, a good king. You know, you read the story of Hezekiah, he did right, what was right in the sight of the Lord. He was just a good king for Judah. Now, just so you understand what we're talking about, you have Israel and Judah under King Solomon. His sons basically split up the kingdom of Israel. So they had called Judah. And most of the popular kings, in, in fact, the line of Jesus comes from the line of Judah. So you would think, oh, Israel, you hear about Israel. No, he comes from the line of Judah. And on those, so there were 12 tribes of Israel. Most of the tribes were part of the southern tribe was made up of Judah and Benjamin. So King Josiah was one of the kings in Judah. And so all the kings we're talking about here come from the southern kingdom of Judah. Are you with me so far? So King Hezekiah was a good king because Judah often had good kings and sometimes they had bad kings. But Israel, out of all the 20 kings that they had throughout the duration of, of this kingdom, they had bad kings all throughout. It was a wicked place. They turned away from God. But Judah was there, they were always struggling. It was one king who came in, did good. Another king came in, did bad. They had to redo everything. And it was this constant tug and um, pull of good king and bad king. So Hezekiah was a good king, but the one who came after him, his son, was named Manasseh. He was actually what a lot of people would call one of the most wicked kings in Judah. This guy was so bad. He undid everything that his father did. 
He set up Asherah poles, which were poles of um, naked ladies sometimes. They would, it would be, sometimes they would be straight up poles that people would just worship, but they were idols. They were idol worship. He set up idol worship throughout the entire land of Judah. He bought idol worship back like Justin Bieber bought, you know what, back. All right? Just to wake y'all up a little bit so y'all ain't sleeping. He practiced divination. In other words, if you're from Haiti, you would understand that as divino, or it's a part or a form of, of Satan worship or voodoo. This guy murdered people. In fact, it was said that he sacrificed children. But then something happened at the end of his term where he decided, whoa, I'm going the wrong way here. And he actually repented from all the things that he did. That was the last piece of his life and he just repented from everything that he did. And we thank God for that. Then we have another king that came under him, which was King Amon. Amon was his son. Amon only served for two years. But the wickedness that he did matched or even was surpassed everything that his father did. So he didn't get part of the repentance part. All he followed was all the wicked parts. So Amon was an evil king who followed in the footsteps of the early years of his dad. He never repented, served a long term. He died very young. But before he died, he had a son. And the son was young when he died. In fact, I believe Josiah, who was a God-fearing king, his dad died when he was five years old, and he took the throne when he was eight years old, as we just read. He tore down every altar, all the idols, all the Asherah poles, everything that was dedicated to Baal and the stars worship, he tore all that down because he was like, something's wrong in here. He led the people well. They loved him. He found an old copy of the scripture hiding in the temple, which no one ever served God in the temple anymore. He went in there and he tore it down and we'll go into that a little bit. And so he started to turn this place around back to God and he made the people start reading the scripture again. His mother's name as we read is Jedidah. Her name means beloved and amiable. Father, or her father's name is Adida. This is gonna be important in a second. And his name means Yahweh passes by. And then they were from a place called Boscath, which meant elevation or on high. So I have three points for you just to get into the life of King Josiah. And the first thing that I'm going to mention to you today is this. Come on. The little things, in fact, become big deals most of the time. I can remember my older brother, JR, I would come home from school every day and I would go to him. He'd take all the change that he has in his pocket and he had a bed against the wall and he would take his change and throw it behind, behind the bed and he'd just lay down. I'm like, why do you always do that? He goes, leave me alone, get out of my room. That's kind of how you talk to me. Older brother, little brother thing. But every day I would watch him do that, come to me and just like take a little change, like a penny or two or five cents and just throw it against the wall and just fall behind his bed. He never checked it, never went back there, never did anything to the money that was falling behind. But we spent years in that apartment in New York City. But when it was time for us to move, we were getting to ready to move his bed and he had a mountain of cash that we had to go, we, we went, in fact, some of that money was what helped us move. So every day he would do it, he, was, he looked at it, he was surprised himself. I had no idea it got this big. But that became his routine, his habit, what he does. All the little things that he does became this big positive thing. But I'm here to tell you, there are some of the little things that we do, come on, that become a mountain for us in our lives, that if we're not careful, if we don't catch the little things that we do, the little attitudes that we have, the little sin that we engage in, the little things that we watch, they become mountainous, they become big, gigantic things in our lives that become immovable, insurmountable products that um, keep us from getting to God. This is where Judah was. The land of Judah became a place that was so filthy after king after king after king 
serving idols here, a little bit there. And you know where it started? Just a little bit of idol worship from King Solomon. And she came and she said, oh, I like this temple. I like what you got going on here. But let me put my little Asherah pole right here. And because Solomon didn't check her, he just let her. It was a little thing that became a bigger thing. When a little thing goes on for long enough, it becomes a big deal. Judah saw good kings and they saw bad kings. Eight of their 20 kings were good. We had Asa, Jehoshaphat, Joash, if you're taking notes, Amaziah, Uriah, Jotham, Hezekiah, and Josiah. Those were your good kings, and everybody else was evil. But it all started from a little place. How do you get from a good king to a bad one? Slowly. Come on. How do you get from an on-fire Christian to a backslider? Slowly. How do you get from a very good marriage to a marriage that is destructive? Slowly. All the little things that you have not checked becomes the big thing that you cannot move. In Songs of Solomon, um, it's funny, it's Solomon, um, in his book, we say this, in Solomon 2, 15, he says, catch, this is the woman talking, catch the little foxes for us, the little foxes that spoil the vineyard. For our vineyards are in blossom. Your vineyard may be in blossom today, but if you're not careful about the little foxes that come into your life, oh boy, will they be spoiled. You're going to be left with a desolate place. The enemy is going to rampage this place. He's going to leave you bare if you're not careful not to check the little things. Again, you don't ruin a friendship in one day. Even if it was one event that caused your friendship to break up, you didn't ruin that in one day. You ruined that over time. You don't ruin, again, a marriage in one day. No, it's ruined in a period of time with unchecked habits and unchecked attitudes. You don't ruin your relationship with Jesus in a day either. But here's the thing. Are you letting someone check you? The scripture says, it said, check the little foxes. It says, it says, catch those foxes, the little foxes. Are you letting someone check those habits that you have? Who do you run to when you know that you're struggling with something that's going to cause you to fall into sin? Who do you call? Do you have a mentor? Do you have a friend that you could run to? Or do you struggle with it on your own? You say, you know, I think I got it. I can remember being a, a, a not really brand new Christian about three years in, in my Christian walk. And I found myself doing everything that I could to, to serve God, and I did. I served God joyfully. I was here every day lifting up my hands, giving my heart up to God. And one day I did something that I completely regret, and I felt ashamed for it. No one knew, but I felt shame. And so immediately I felt the Holy Spirit tell me, you need to tell somebody. I ended up walking, I'm calling one of my friends. I said, hey man, we need to meet up. Christian guy, he was in the same faith with me. I mean, we're strong, we're, we're pushing together. He comes up, he calls me, say, hey, what's going on? I tell him about what's going on. I, I spill my heart to him, I'm vulnerable, I just tell him. And he looks at me, he goes, I'm gonna pray for you, but guess what, man? I'm going through the same thing. See, often you go through things. It's not only for you. Often you go through things for people. I can tell you right here, like if one person is dealing with something in this place, I can guarantee you that someone else is dealing with the very same thing. A lot of these things, they come in waves. The enemy comes and he's gonna, you think the enemy come, comes in this room, he's gonna attack you and just leave you without feeling some kind of threat. But that's how it works. You often go through things, but other people go through it too. So it's important, as the scripture said, to share your sins with one another. Share your burdens with one another. Share everything with one another, it's important, but be careful who you share it with. Because you got that one person say, hey, tell me everything you got, let me pray for you. Before you know it, everyone else is saying, how, did you, how do they know about this situation? And this is Jesus saying, don't cast your pearl, come on, to swine. 
lest they take it from, from you, cast it on the floor, and rend you. They'll tear you apart with the gossip. They'll tear you apart with the news that they'll share about you. But in Proverbs 15, 32, it says, those who disregard discipline despise themselves. That's a, that's a pretty crazy word. Those who discipline despise themselves. And that brings me to the verse where Jesus says to the Pharisees, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and strength, and then love your neighbor as you love yourself. There's that part of it that loving yourself part sometimes is the hardest part for us to do. But according to the scripture here, it seems the reason why we can't get to loving ourselves is because we don't like correction. We don't want anyone to, to air out our dirty laundry. We want anyone to read our mail. If we're dealing with something, we want to deal with it on our own and we feel good about it when we say, man, I could pray for myself about my situation. Let me tell you something. If you're keeping everything to yourself, you're not being vulnerable. And God asks us to be vulnerable. Often many of us think that we're being vulnerable, but we're just being honest. And there's a difference. The difference is if somebody asks me for something and I tell them, I was just honest with you. But if you didn't ask me for anything and I tell you what's going on, that's being vulnerable. And I think that's where a lot of Christians lack is in our vulnerability and we confuse our honesty for vulnerability. God is saying share with one another. He doesn't say wait to be asked and then tell somebody. It's important that we open up our hearts to leadership, open up our hearts to friendship, people that are in our lives that can actually speak into our lives and also pray with us with all the things that we go through. I would hate for anyone in this place to be going through something and it's killing you, it's crushing you, and you feel like you can't talk to anybody. That is a depressing place to be. It's a lonely place to be. But I'm here to tell you, you have people in this place at the river with listening ears, open hearts, ready to pray with you. Amen. The second thing is this. Change comes from unsuspecting places. You'll find that as you live this life, you'll find that the change that you're looking for in your life It'll come from unsuspecting places. Places that you don't even expect. Places that you weren't looking for. See, Josiah was the king that God raised up. It's like when God was picking his king for Israel. He said, I want to be your king. He looked at Israel and said, I, I'm going to be your king. Israel said, well, everybody else has a, a human king. Why well, we got to have an invisible one? He said, you want, an, you want a human king? I'll get you the best thing that, that can come out of your, your place right now. I'll give you Saul. They say, oh, we love Saul. Saul is what we expect. Saul is strong. Saul looks heroic. Saul is handsome. Saul can speak. But Saul is evil to the core. Because he is not a man after my own heart. And so God gives them what they want and they got what they deserved. But then God now, who gives them a second chance because his first plan for Israel was that he would be their king, unsuspecting. It was a little boy. Yeah, he was handsome, but he was tiny. Yeah, he was strong, but he didn't have any weapons and he didn't have any armor. It was King David who would go into a battle for a whole entire cowardice people to step into the battle where no one would step up to go against a giant. It was this little boy, a shepherd, that went up and did that. God will use people in your life. God will use things in your life that you do not expect to change your circumstances. Look what he does. He picks a little boy by the name of Josiah to become the king of Judah. This kid was only eight years old when he became king. How many of you guys, if a third grader was running for the 2024 election, you say, that's my guy. <laughs> that's him right there. You know, eighth grader all the way, baby. Well, was a third grader all the way, baby. You know? 
Who would want that? None of us. Why? Because in our minds, he does not have the experience. He does not have the, the brain power. He's not mature enough. He's not tall enough. He's not good looking enough. Whatever it is in your mind you think about that third grader, if God picked him, he's the guy. That works with everything in our lives. Sometimes God sends somebody in your life to be a relationship. Come on. I'm going there. <laughs> and I must. You say, well, God, they don't look like what I want. Me small. Come on. Ask for a tall glass of water. <laughs> you gave me a short thing from Florida. And we look at the outward appearance, but what did God say? He said, God doesn't look at the outward appearance, but he looks at the inward. He looks what's inside of you. God knew there was something inside of Josiah that would have been something good to turn that land around. How did he know it was there? Because he put it there. He formed him before he was even born. He placed that thing in him. He knew the heart that he had. He put it there and he said, this is going to be my king. This is going to be my king. Eight years old. He's learning. He's practicing. But my thing is, I'm thinking to myself, why was he a good king? Why, why was Josiah a good king? His father was a horrible man. His grandfather was a horrible man. His great-great-grandfather was an evil person. He grew up in the worst case scenario to be a good king. But somehow, just somehow, he ended up as a really good king. I have a theory. And, and my theory comes from because they somehow place the names in there. If you look at his mother's name, Jediah, Jedida, it means beloved. If you look at his father, Yahweh passes by. If you look at where they're from, it was called Boscath, which was a place called Elevation when you translate it. So if you ask me, despite the circumstances that he comes from, despite the fact that his father was a loser, his father's father was an evil man, his father's father's father was a, a horrible king, somehow God placed a woman in his father's life that would have a, a godly father herself, that when he would pass away, they would still be around when he became king. So that means Jediah, beloved, Adiah, Yahweh passes by from above. Beloved, Yahweh passes by from, a love, from above. And I'm here to tell you that today. I don't care what kind of environment you grew up in in your life. Beloved, Yahweh passes by from above. Some of us look at our past and think that that's all who we are. That's all, that's all I am. That's all I'll ever be. My father was a thief. I'll be one too. My mom was a liar. I'll be one too. My mom was in a bad relationship. She was abused. I'm going to be abused too. It doesn't have to be that way because beloved, whoo, Yahweh, your God Almighty passes by. And his thoughts are for you. We sang that today. He is for you. He is for you. He is for I love that song because you have to repeat that to yourself. He is for me. I got to remind myself, he is for me. Because my environment will always tell me something different, but he is for me. He is for me. There's something tricky about environments. Environments can have a way with us. We can step into the room and because everyone is negative, it just does something to your inside. It, it plays around with your emotions and you could have had the greatest day, but you won't remember it because all you remember is this bad environment. Environments have a way of, of taking over our feelings. 
taken over the power that is within us that God gives to us. I'm here to tell you that Jesus never fell victim to his environment, but Jesus always ruled his. And that's what he often taught his disciples. Can you imagine a Jesus, a God of yours? You're in a boat and the boat is going crazy. The waves are higher than the boat at this time. And in so much that the disciples came to Jesus and woke him up, he was sleeping. He said, Master, do you not care if we die? That's what they said. Do you not care if we die? Jesus wiping the coal out of his eye. <laughs> Somebody caught it. Got up, said, man, you faithless generation, what must I do? Do when you still ain't learn? He gets out, wants to go back to sleep, so he looks at his environment and he says, oh my gosh, waves. No, that ain't Jesus. Jesus steps into his environment. He says, peace, be still. You know, if the disciples didn't learn enough to do it as Jesus taught them, they were lucky enough that Jesus was in the boat with them, that he could do it for them. See, maybe some of us here are faith-filled so much that we know how. But even if you have a prayer that you can go, you can still go, wake up the master. Lord, I'm going through something. My environment doesn't look too good. Jesus will still step in and tell it, peace, be still. Because beloved, Yahweh passes by, comes down from on high. Hallelujah. Eight-year-old boy. He's in third or fourth grade. And in his 20s, he started really making changes in the land of Judah. It was 18 years after he became king, he started making changes. He was like, all right, it's time. It reminds me of the ministry of Jesus, if you ask me. You know, Jesus get, comes on the scene as a baby and then you hear about him when he's 12 years old and you don't hear about him again until he's 30 years old. And he begins to make changes, shifting atmosphere, healing the sick, raising the dead, all this stuff is happening. And, but you could see like in his early age, he didn't do anything, he was like soaking everything in. And Josiah is the same. He's just soaking everything in from, I believe, his mom's side of the family who believed in the Lord. And it got, it got to the point where he was like, all right, I'm ready to make some changes here because I don't like what I see. He started to rebuild the temple that Solomon built. Because through all the worship that they were doing in there was not worshiping the Lord, they had a lot of idols in that place. Judah was lost. He came into that place, he said, knock that one down, pull that one down, crush that one. He went outside of the temple. He was like, I don't like this. He even got to a place, he said, whose grave is this? Because <laughs> if he wasn't a good man, I want you to exhume his body and burn it. I don't want it here. If he was an idol worship, I don't want him here. He said, whose grave is this? They said, that's the grave of the man that prophesied that you would come. He said, don't touch it. Read the word. Don't touch it. I want him here. Because years before him, way before him, somebody came. Born in Jerusalem. His back. They prophesied he was coming. And he came. He started turning things around. Tearing down altars. Burning everything. But he brought Can you imagine that? Josiah was in the land of Judah for so long. They, were, they had been so far from the Lord. No one there observed the Passover. No one there remembered that, that God called men to put the blood of the lamb on the, on the lintels and posts of the doors. No one remembered that when the spirit of death would come into their land that they would pass over them. No one celebrated that anymore. But Josiah said, we're going to celebrate the Passover. He brought it back. He's bringing it back. Come on, say, bring it back. Some of y'all been forgetting what God had told you. Some of y'all forgot what God has spoken into your life years ago. Some of you guys forgot what God, you know, called you to be. And you've fallen into a place of, of 
It's not idol worship, but it could be because you stop thinking about the Lord and start thinking about something else. That's an idol. Whatever you prioritize in your life, it becomes an idol. Whatever is magnified in your life is an idol. I don't care if it's a physical object or if it's something inside your mind. If you're thinking about it too much more than God, it's an idol. It's, in, it's, in, it's important for us to come now and tear down our idols. Break down these idols. Break down the idol of I'm not good enough. Break down the idol of I'm too good for you. Come on. Break down those idols, tear down those walls and clean house. And somebody say, bring it back. Josiah brought it back. He said, this is not who we are. But guess what? This is not who they expected for their king. He leads God's people, but that's not who they expected to lead God's people. He's not who they expected to be the catalyst for change in that moment. I sound like a politician. I'm going to put that word on my vocabulary. We need to find the catalyst for change. Anyway. <laughs> he's not... He's not the one they expected to start a revival because this is what that was. Israel was dead. Israel died. They were on their way to you know where, the underworld. But it didn't start one day. It was the little foxes, the little gossip, the little slight, the little lie, the little thing, little thought, just the little things. Until they got to a point where they were so far from God, they forgot everything about him until a child had to come to remind them. Out of the mouth of babes, that's what Jesus said. Babies. From somewhere that you wouldn't expect, God could bring it back. But if you're shutting off everything in your life, no, I want to deal with this myself. No, I want to, no, no, back up. You want to deal with everything yourself and you're pushing away parents, you're pushing away friends, you're pushing away pastors. And, and, and it's, it's not so much that you're saying, I don't want your help. Let me show you how it, how it works. Man, I have, pastor says, I haven't thought of so-and-so for a long time. Let me give him a call. Oh, I don't feel like having that conversation. It's the little thing. You didn't, you didn't, it's, it's not that you didn't pick up the phone. It's that you pushed him away. That's what you did. But it, it, it's, it's so vital for us to understand this concept. Opening up our hearts before things become too toxic to fix. I'm going to stay right there. So God will often send people you don't expect to challenge you into the right direction. That's what happens. People who God sent into your life is not always going to be this sweet deal that always says the right thing that you always want to hear. The people that God sent into will not just, just move you. They will challenge you into the right direction. And that's how you know sometimes when somebody's not right for you because they don't challenge you. <laughs> you walk around like, oh, this is just another day in the park. I've been here before. Oh, you know, they're beautiful, they're cute, they're this, 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 and that, this, and that. You got all this stuff, but there's no challenge. If I say I want to go to church, okay, let's go to church too. If I say I don't want to go to church, I'm cool, I'll stay here with you. If I want to do this one, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, do you care if I die? Like, you know what a friend does? Challenge you. 
You know what a, a, a real good boyfriend, godly boyfriend or girlfriend, they challenge you. You know what a good pastor does? They challenge you. You know what, a good, chi what good children are? <laughs> Come on, somebody! <laughs> you don't know challenge until you get some kids. I'm about to have two. Pray for me. They challenge you. But you know what they challenge you into? Come on, watch this. You, even kids, they're children. Josiah was a child. You know what they challenge you into? The right direction. Spend all of my time on you. That's my getaway. Don't judge me. All right? All right? I like to learn. I go on YouTube binges and rabbit trails like you wouldn't believe. I'm like, man, you wouldn't believe what, like, learn about the temple of God. Oh my gosh, just dive in to learning all types of stuff. But guess what? Your child goes, I'm hungry. Somebody gotta feed me. I gotta get up off that couch. They challenge you to the right thing. Your child goes, I got, it's so funny, my, my son knows how to go to the bathroom. <laughs> but he will not go to the bathroom without my permission and without me standing there. You say, Daddy, I gotta pee, jumping around, I gotta pee. And then all of a sudden I'm like, go pee. He goes, ooh, I got, he'll run inside the bathroom, he'll run back, I say, I, I, I can't. I'm like, just go pee. He's like, I'm watching YouTube, you know? Runs back into the bathroom. And he's like, he's like, I can't. And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go in there. So I go in, I go to the bathroom, I stand. Soon as he sees me step inside of that bathroom, he runs to the toilet, opens it, drops his pants, does his thing, pull up his pants, like, <laughs> walks out and I'm sitting there like, I, I, every time I, 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 say, I say this, did daddy do anything? He goes, no. I go, so why do you need me here? I don't know when he'll jump out of that phase soon. Thank you. That's a real mom right there. <laughs> but I need it. It's challenging. Because my wife can't get me off YouTube. Come on, somebody. <laughs> but my son can. <laughs> I think you were here, babe. Just say. They challenge you into the right direction. You may not agree with who they are. You may not agree with what they do. You may not agree with what they represent. You may not agree with how they speak. You may not agree with why they are in your life. You may not agree with why they are your supervisor. You may not agree why they work with you. You may not agree why they're in your family. You may not even agree why they are friends with your friends. Come on, somebody. Y'all know y'all got those friends of friends. Why do you keep them around? I actually don't know why I keep them around. I'll tell you why they keep them around. For you, because you don't let they challenge you. They come in your life telling you what's going on. They challenge you into the right direction. Keep in mind, just because somebody's annoying doesn't mean that they're challenging in the right way. Disclaimer, there are some people who provoke you. There's a difference. When people provoke you, it's different than when they challenge you. And I don't know the difference, so I can't tell you, sorry. I know y'all was waiting for it too. Ooh, it's good, it's gonna be good. He's gonna tell me what the difference is. I don't know. Pastors don't know everything and it's okay. But when I do, you're gonna hear from a sermon. Praise the Lord, amen. But God has a plan. And the plan is to challenge you, to get you to a place where you yourself would not walk into because you don't know goodness until God shows it to you. We're all sheep. That's why, that's why Jesus paints us as sheep. He could have painted us as any animal. But there's a shepherd that stands has a staff in his hands, and sheep goes, I don't care about nothing but my stomach. 
I don't care about anything but what pleases me. I don't care about anything. But if he's a good sheep, when he hears that shepherd's voice, he knows where to go. If he's a rebellious sheep, he hears that shepherd's voice, he's like, I'm still hungry. That's that sheep. Most of us are that way. I do want to move on from this, but I, I do have a story I want to share with you about being challenged in the right direction. I went to a conference one time and I was asked to speak and I gave it the best that I got. I mean, I, I went in now shouting at people, pointing at them, just kidding. <laughs> I gave it the best that I got. Came down on stage. I met this young man. He was from India, fresh from India. And came to me. He was like, Pastor, that was an amazing word. I said, praise the Lord. Thank God. Thank you. And I said, what's your name? He said, John Amos Taram. I said, that's, a, that's your first name? He said, no, it's my whole name. I said, why'd you tell me your whole name? Anyway, besides the point. <laughs> <laughs> he said, John. Bible. We started talking. It was a really pleasant conversation. After the conversation, the young man looked at me and he said, Pastor, I'm going to be praying for you. I said, I'd appreciate that. And then he took my number. Amen. Walked away. He called me the next day. He said, hey, good morning, Pastor. I texted him. I said, hey, it's John Amos. I said, all right. Good morning. And then for the rest of the day, he didn't text me. I was like, did I say something? Like, it's good. <laughs> like, do you not respond with good morning in India? I don't know. He didn't respond. He didn't say anything for the rest of the day. And I was like, okay. I texted him back midday. I said, how are you doing? He said, oh, doing great. Thank you. And then I was like, nothing else. I was like, all right, cool. I said, all right. He doesn't know how to have small talk. It's all right. Um, maybe I'll see him another time. The next morning, I get another text message. Good morning, pastor. I said, hey, he's back. Hey, good morning, John. I'm like, I'm like, bro, I thought I was a bad texter. Like, he's really bad at this. So the following morning, he says, good morning, pastor. I said, okay, now he's just messing with me. I said, good morning, John. How are you doing? He said, doing great. Thank you for asking. And I said, I said, you good? <laughs> he's like, yes, I am. I was like. I said, okay, now at this point, this is chat GPT. <laughs> Does it again and again and again. I've tried to have a long conversation with him by asking specific, like, you know, open-ended questions. Like, he just would answer it and he'd be done with me. I'm like, oh, are you kidding me? I said, I got to the point, guys. I was getting a little bit frustrated. I said, because now he's playing with me. I actually went a few days where I saw Good Morning. I was like, no. <laughs> I am not answering that. You are playing with me. I got angry. I was like, what kind of joke is this? What kind of thing is this, man? Really getting frustrated. And then finally, about maybe a month in, literally, he says, good morning, pastor. I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to really get at him. I said, good morning, John, how are you? You know those texts where you're really mad, but you sound nice when it goes? That. Good morning, John, how are you? He said, doing great, pastor. I said, I'm doing well. He goes, he goes, that's good. And I said, I, said, <laughs> I wish I could show you the text up here. I said, you know what, John? I've been praying for you. John texted me back. I've been praying for you too, Pastor. In fact, every time I pray for you in the morning, I send you a good morning message. Talk about feeling conviction. You see, he was an unsuspecting person, 
that was to come to a master. While I get into my routine of prayer, I would often say to people, how you doing? Doing well? How can I pray for you? How can I pray for you? Anything? Perfect. I'll be praying for you. You go home. Nada. You pray for your family. You pray for your church. You pray for everything. And that person is not even in your mind. So in turn, all of the times when we say, I'll pray for you, and we don't, we're lying. That's not good for the kingdom. But thank God for brothers and sisters that God has revealed to in other places who have developed different routines and habits for themselves to remind themselves to pray for people. For doing something that he was actually doing for me to benefit me, I was being challenged to pray better. That should be all of our hope, that God would place someone like a Josiah into our Judah to turn things around, to shake it up. Come on. Y'all been stale for too long. You used to be on fire. What happened? You used to pray all the time. What happened? You used to serve. What happened? You used to worship. What happened? What happened? What happened? Pray that God would raise up a Josiah in your life to shake things up. Amen. I'm going to close with this. Whatever is lost doesn't have to be a loss. See, something that is lost, if it's a loss, it's ultimate. The good news is most of the things we're talking about here, which is the passion, getting back to the heart of worship, getting back to who Jesus is in our lives, getting back to surrendering, getting back to real prayer, getting back to authenticity, realness with God. If you've lost any portion of that, good news, whatever is lost can be found. It can be found. The wrong job, the wrong relationship, the wrong argument, the wrong mindset, and it's pulling you away from Jesus and he's become your secondary focus and whatever you have has become your primary. You've lost him, but he's easy to be found. You know what it says in the book of Revelation? Jesus is speaking to the church of Ephesus, who in my opinion have been doing some great and mighty things according to his word. I know your works, your labor, they work, they labor, your patience. Half of us in this room can't even say we have that. Your patience and that you cannot bear with those who are evil, they're righteous. Ooh. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not. They are confronting, they are righteous, and they do the right thing. Hmm. And have found themselves liars. They go against liars and they tell the truth. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake. And they do it all for Jesus. They do it all for him. It's always for him. They do it and have not become weary of doing it. Nevertheless, you lost something. It has become about the works. It has become about the labor. It has become about how good you could be patient for God. It's become about how, how good for Him, you do it for Him, but it's become about that and less about him. He says, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left 
your first love. You left it. You left your first love and went to do ministry. You left your first love and went into a relationship. You left your first love and just paid more attention to your kids. You left your first love and focused on work. You left your first love and it's all about your studies. You left and you lost something. But the good news is you can find it. Whatever you lost in this season can be found. I want to leave you with one thing from 2 Kings chapter 22 where we were just reading. To this. Now it came to pass in the 18th year of King Josiah, this is the beginning, that the king sent Shaphan of Meshulam to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to Hilkal the high priest, that he may count the money which has been brought into the house of the Lord which the doorkeepers have gathered from the people. Then Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan, the scribe. I'm skipping through, by the way, because it's a very long story. Then Hilkiah, the priest, said to Shaphan, the scribe. Listen to this. I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. We skip down again, it says, now it happened when the king heard the words, Josiah heard that they found this book of the law. I can't do it, but he did. He tore his clothes off. Just, ah! Just tore it off. He found something. He found his passion back. He found something where he was gonna feel now that he's no longer doing all this work by himself, but the law could speak for him. He can now bring back the seven year jubilee where they would sit in front of the whole entire kingdom and have the priest read the law to everyone. They would understand the law. He was excited, he tore his clothes off. Hallelujah. Then he went to a prophetess's house. And the prophetess tells Josiah, Y'all found the book good. But here's what the Lord has to say. He has a wrath that he's getting ready for all the sins of your fathers. But you, O king, you will not even get to see it. You won't see that, that tribulation. You won't see God's wrath. Poor Josiah. He dies at the age of 39. But that was God's grace. God would rather have him with him than allow such a passionate, faithful man to experience the wrath and the turmoil he was going to land down on these unfaithful, on this unfaithful generation. Listen to this. Josiah found the book, <laughs> but he wasn't even looking for it. In fact, Josiah found a book that he didn't even know that was there. He sent them to go tear down the idols and rebuild the temple. And all of a sudden, he found the book. Some of us in this place are asking ourselves, how do I find this passion back? How do I find this, this, this whatever I lost? How do I find that back again, God? God says, tear down the idols and build the temple <laughs> and you will find whatever it is that you lost. Hallelujah. You'll find it. You don't know what you're looking for because you don't Tear down the idols. Tear it down build up the temple and you will find whatever it is that you lost and I close with this Josiah is just like Jesus Josiah was a king 
Jesus is the King of Kings. Josiah came on the scene as a child. Jesus came on the scene as a baby. Josiah came to turn things around. Jesus turned everything around. Josiah died in his 30s. Jesus died at 33. The only difference is this. Josiah died, and whoever came after him undid everything that he did. But Jesus died. He didn't stay dead. He rose again, so he's still king on the throne. So whatever he does today remains for each and every one of us. God is good. God is good. Can we stand to our feet? Some of us in here maybe have some things in our lives where you can look at yourself in the mirror today and you say, Pastor, I feel like I look different than two, two, two weeks ago. I look different than... than I, wish I could say that the difference is better. But honestly, the difference is worse. I feel like I'm not pressing in. I feel like I don't know Jesus anymore. I feel like I'm like I used to. I feel like I'm doing too much ministry and not enough Jesus. I feel like I've, I have an idol before me that I'm trying to, to keep up. To keep, it keeps wanting to fall, but I keep erecting my idol back up. But Jesus saying, it's okay to let it fall. If it's a good thing in your life, God will hold it for you. No matter how much it wobbles, it will never fall if it's a God thing. So you don't have to maintain it. You need to maintain your relationship with Jesus. With all heads bowed and eyes closed in this place, if today you came in and you feel, you could say, I feel like I've taken a step back in my worship. I feel like I've taken a step back in my devotion. I feel like I've taken a step back in my love for Jesus. And I want to get to that place where I know him and I hear from him and he leads me. If you want to get back to that place, come on up in here. Come on right up here and I'll pray with you. We're going to restore this relationship. I'm going to restore this relationship. Hallelujah. Bless your name, God. Bless your name, Jesus. Whether you're here or back there, keep your eyes closed and heads bowed. I'm going to ask you also if you feel like you've backslidden so far that you can't you can't say for yourself that I know that if I were to go today if God were to take me home if God would take me away from this earth I don't know if I would have a place with him in heaven because of how far I've slid back if that's you today just lift your hands where you're at with all heads bowed and eyes closed and I'll see you and I'll pray over you hallelujah I see you. Anybody else? I see you. Anybody? I see you too. Anybody else? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed either. Hallelujah. You can put your hands down. I'm going to make one more call. If you've never given your life to Jesus and you want to do that today because there's eternity in relationship with Jesus. Once you give your life to Jesus, confess with your mouth and believe and you follow him and you want to follow Jesus today you want to make him the Lord of your life it's your first time doing it lift up your hands really nice and proud and I'll see you and I'll pray over you right now we're going to secure you and seal with the Holy Spirit go ahead and lift your hands and I'll see you hallelujah